Hello everybody and welcome to Surveillance Support 153 and this is the Q&A for all of our amazing patrons who have questions for uh, this week myself uh, but also like one of the questions is for Nate so normally it's for both of us but either way if you want to join this Q&A and ask us anything you want and contribute to the podcast and keep us going forever and ever definitely check out our Patreon down below or uh, at patreon.com slash surveillance pod. Thank you all very much for your questions and thank you any new patrons and thank you to Current patrons who don't ask questions, you're all great. Uh, so the first question is from Mr. Camel 999 and it's actually a question for Nate, where Nate talked about removing something about a part of a car. So uh, he, he, they don't remember what the part was, so I'm going to cut to Nate's response. Nate said it's the modem, so make sure to check out what you can do uh, with the modem for your specific vehicle. Uh, so next question is from Frank, and I'm going to summarize this. Essentially, Frank uses a VPN, but they find that uh, on some websites it's blocked, and so they have to disable the VPN just for those websites, and they were wondering if there was a way to do some kind of per-site tunneling, like you can exclude certain sites from the VPN. I personally haven't found a very good workflow for this. I personally just do just disable and enable a VPN uh, per site. One thing I have done in the past, which kind of helped, is I was able to set up certain VPN connections. Like I currently am using iVPN and Molvad, and I realized that on some websites, uh, iVPN is blocked, but Molvad isn't, and vice versa, depending on the website. And so you are able to access certain websites on certain devices. So I use iVPN on mobile and Molvad on desktop for other reasons. Uh, but for example, if uh, let's say your email provider uh, blocks, this is totally made up. So let's say your email provider blocks iVPN. Maybe you just don't use the email provider on mobile and you only use it on desktop. So you can kind of separate this out a little bit uh, per device. Now some operating systems and VPNs offer some version of split tunneling, like on Android, you can exclude certain applications. So that is something you might be able to look into. Um, I'm not super familiar with which VPNs offer that functionality on desktops though. So that's something you're gonna have to dig a little bit more into. And uh, sadly, that's personally what I do. I haven't found a much better solution. So if anyone has a better solution, definitely leave it in the comments because I know that uh, what Frank and myself are experiencing are not unique in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure anyone who uses a VPN deals with issues like this. Uh, next question is from Barnaby, and it's what do you think about decentralized VPNs? Is it safe to use, better than conventional VPN services? Etc. cetera. Uh, I'm actually gonna point you to an interview I did with the Safing team. So Safing has something called the SPN, which is a version similar to a decentralized VPN. And they actually talk about what a decentralized VPN is, where some of them can excel, where they can fall behind. And I feel like despite them having the SPN and running their own decentralized VPN service, they're very nice and they're very friendly and they're very, I felt, objective uh, covering other services as well and what you should look for in a decentralized VPN. So I'll leave that link down in a description. That's definitely what I would point you to because it's pretty complicated and he, also explains the difference between VPN, Tor, decentralized VPN, and all these different things uh, because it's a little bit messy and a little bit complicated. But I would say uh, overwhelmingly at the moment, um, it's tough for me to just give a broad recommendation for any kind of decentralized VPN services uh, just because they're a little bit less developed and a little bit less mature and there's a little bit less research than what we see over on the VPN and Tor side of things, which are a lot more established and a lot easier for someone like myself to recommend broadly to people listening. But um, maybe there might be one or two people out there that might benefit more from a decentralized VPN. I'm just not in a position right now to be able to comfortably uh, give an outright recommendation for one. So uh, yeah, I'll, again, I'll leave a video uh, down to that interview down in the description, and hopefully that gives you a lot more insight and you will come out of that feeling a lot more educated, I feel. Uh, next question is from The Dressing Gown. You often refer to stock Android, but when looking online, I become less clear what stock Android actually is when trying to get it from my Samsung. Can you please elaborate what it is? Yeah, so good question. So I guess I'm gonna start with the bare bones here. So the open source Android project is called Android Open Source Project, which is AOSP. That is probably the closest thing to vanilla Android. It doesn't have Google Play services. It really doesn't have anything outside of just the Android operating system and pretty much the open source uh, aspects of it. 
Now, when myself and other people refer to stock Android, normally what we're referring to is the ROM that ships with Google Pixels. So when Google uh, releases the Google Pixel 8, which they just did with seven years of updates, which is super freaking cool, you're gonna get it in the box, you're gonna open the box, you're gonna take the phone out, and it's gonna be running this version of stock Android, uh, which is what we refer to it as, as well as most people. So this stock Android is pretty much that ROM that's shipped uh, by Google directly. A lot of people like stock Android because it's very minimal, all things considered. Like all it is is AOSP with Google Play services and then a few extra Google apps on it, but you're not gonna find all the other garbage. It's really just like the Google suite, everything you need to be in the Google ecosystem, and then that's kind of it. Um, whereas if you go and buy a Samsung phone from Verizon, you're gonna have all of the Google stuff, as well as all the Samsung stuff, as well as sometimes even the Verizon stuff. Um, so typically when we say as close to stock as possible, we're looking for uh, Android ROMs that try to stick to those ideals of stock. So a company in the past I've heard is pretty good about this is Motorola, for example. I haven't used Motorola. I don't know how true that is, but I've heard from people that Motorola tends to stick pretty close to stock. Pretty much meaning like Motorola doesn't bloat uh, the operating system too much beyond just the Google ecosystem. So I would say stock Android is typically similar to just Google's ecosystem version of Android. And then AOSP is just the Android open source project. So as for your Samsung question here, um, I don't know what you're going to find. You're not gonna be able to install Google stock Android on Samsung, but you can look at custom ROMs that are very similar to AOSP. So I'd be looking at Lineage OS um, for your phone, but I don't know which Samsung device you have. A lot of Samsung devices aren't very friendly for flashing custom ROMs. So it really depends what you can do on your particular device. I would look at XDA to see uh, your phone on XDA to see if there are any supported ROMs or something you can do on your phone uh, to make it a little bit more respecting to whatever your, your goal is. Next question is from David Johnson and they ask, what do you think is the most private and secure way to implement TOTP 2FA, which is those six digit codes that generate every 30 seconds and which approach do you prefer to use? While Google Authenticator is popular, it has obvious privacy drawbacks of supplying Google with the list of sites and services you use. It seems that apps recommended as more privacy respecting like Authy, uh, Aegis, NT uh, would have their share of similar issues, namely needing to create an account and having the catalog of the site you use and the seed codes stored by the provider. Uh, so I, I think you might be, you're, 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 you're thinking well, but I think that a lot of this isn't quite accurate. Um, I don't actually think, especially if you don't enable the sync, uh, I haven't seen, could be wrong, if someone has actual evidence of this, please link it to me, but I don't think Google actually collects the list of all services that you use for their TOTP 2FA. Now, I know you're gonna get people that are gonna say, well, it's proprietary, we have no way to tell, but you could, in theory, on an Android device, just disable, if you have a firewall, you could just disable internet access to Google Authenticator, and it will be a completely offline app, and it functions completely offline. You don't need to sync it. Uh, and actually, Aegis uh, is the same way. So Aegis is open source, so you can verify this without having to trust anything. And it is completely offline. It actually is the, because you, you say later, it seems to be more secure to run the code generation software locally and store the seed codes for backup in an offline password manager database. That is exactly what Aegis does. So Aegis is completely offline. You scan the code and they actually have a backup file that you can store anywhere you want. And the backup file itself is encrypted. So you don't even need to have a password manager database. You just store all your codes on Aegis, do a backup, keep that file anywhere you want on a flash drive, on a different computer, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you can always restore from that backup and that backup itself is encrypted. So even if someone gets your flash drive, unless they know the password, they won't gain access to your codes. So um, NT as well, actually just released offline functionality. So it used to be account-based, but now NT also has the ability to set up without an account. So both of those services now uh, allow that. So yeah, it's. I think it's good that you're considering this as an issue because it definitely would be an issue, but I think for a lot of these services, it's not. Authy is the main exception to this because Authy, uh, I don't know if you can, I don't like Authy for those who know me, I'm not a big fan of Authy. I don't like the phone number requirement. They've had that security issue in the past now. And I don't like uh, cloud-based syncing, um, which is especially for something like TOTP 2FA. And also Authy is proprietary. So there's, there's lots of reasons why I don't like Authy. Um, I don't know if you can download Authy and use it completely offline in the app. So if anyone uses Authy, definitely share if you can do that. I don't know if they allow that functionality. I do know that the main reason anyone would ever use Authy 
instead of these other alternatives is because of the syncing that Authy provides. And I personally wouldn't recommend that because it's tied to an account and it's web-based kind of like you're talking about. So uh, those are some of my thoughts on it. I still think you're better off using Authy versus no 2FA. So uh, I definitely think using any of these is better than nothing, um, especially when we haven't really seen clear evidence of these services abusing the TOTP 2FA, uh, but we have seen a plethora of evidence that not having 2FA is very bad. So again, we need to value like what the actual evidence is and what the real risks are versus hypothetical risks. And while we can always try to target those hypothetical risks, don't let the hypothetical risks get in the way of the real risks. Um, I'm just prioritize your threats accordingly, is what I would say. Um, yeah, but I'd be looking at Aegis and NT at this point. I still need to test NT Authenticator uh, now that they have offline functionality um, because ever since Rivo had their whole incident, I think a lot of people are trying to find alternatives, especially on iOS. All right, and the last question is from what's in a name. Have either of you looked into iOS, Siri, and search privacy? If not, maybe someone can answer on a later Q&A, but it seems like it leaks a ton of data. My understanding is if I type a search, all the apps on my phone can see what I typed. I ran into this because I turned that setting off for ZipRecruiter, but when I typed to search for something on my phone, it still searched ZipRecruiter. Seems trivial for an app to log that data, even by last accessed if it can't directly track it. Let me share with what I do know. I do know that Siri and a lot of Siri features uh, collect a little bit more data about you within the iOS ecosystem. So if you're someone who's trying to prevent Apple from gathering a little bit more information about you, I would recommend against the Siri features. Um, now, here's where I'm a little bit confused. I haven't tested this, nor do I know. I don't know what kind of access apps have to your search results in this, because you're actually talking about third-party privacy concerns. You're concerned that App X is able to access your search results from here, as well as App Y, as well as App Z. I personally haven't seen this because when I search for something in Spotlight, for example, um, it'll say maybe use search results in this app, or it's pretty much the way I, and again, please, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. The way I understand this works is that, let's say you have Signal. Signal doesn't do this because Signal opts out of this, but let's say you have 20 conversations in Signal, what Signal will do is when the app is open and you're using Signal, it will pretty much store that information and tell Apple like, hey, we have these conversations, please index this. So it'll say like, okay, you have these five group chats, you have these 10 DMs and you have these five other people that are strangers to you. And then when you go into Spotlight, uh, Apple pretty much, or your iPhone already is able to go, okay, well, Signal told us that these are the things within the app uh, that can be searched for. And so you type in this group chat and then you can open it in Signal. I don't think that's possible in Signal because Signal, it doesn't even do that in the first place. But I'm fairly certain that pretty much the app feeds the iPhone information about what's within the app. And so then the iPhone is able to index the information and then you can search for that. That is my understanding. I could be completely wrong about that, but I don't think that it's something that's actively done where you type a search in and then that search is then distributed to every app and then the apps return back with information. Um, I'm fairly certain that those apps actually report to Apple when they're open and when you use them and then it's indexed. And then from there, Apple just stores a central index and then when you search, it's able to just go through that index without reporting back to the app every single search. That's my understanding, but please correct me if I'm wrong. People who know more in the comments about this specific issue, definitely let me know. Um, I'm fairly certain that's how it works, but again, I am not uh, really an expert on this, nor do I understand the iOS ecosystem that thoroughly. So if anyone knows better, please let me know, but I'm fairly certain that's how it works. Um, and that's why you can actually turn this off. You have to go into the settings for that app and turn off the setting to be able to search within a specific app, and then the app won't pretty much feed that information to iOS. But I actually think it's done in a much more privacy respecting way than you're uh, under the impression of. Or maybe you're completely right about how it's done. Again, uh, that's just my thoughts and how I'm under the impression that it was being done. And that is it for the week. Again, if you want to ask a question and or just support this podcast and keep it free, this is kind of our way of kind of engaging with all of you and saying thanks uh, for supporting what we do. Uh, you can be a part of this by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash surveillance pod down in the description. I'll leave a card for those on YouTube. And if you're on the audio podcast, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, definitely go check it out. So yeah, thank you all for tuning in and I will see you this weekend for the next episode and then next week for the next Q&A.